to rain. And you know, no matter how, how rainy our day looks, God is that ray of sunshine around us every day. Amen. I'm thanking Him right now in front of everybody for being by my side. As the song said a while ago, He's with us in the fire, no matter what. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He prays you, God.
very special way. Speak the words that we need to hear in our spirit and heart and draw us close to your side as we so desperately need to know you more, to experience you in greater ways than we've ever done. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. This is not on your notes, but so I didn't have a lot of space to do all I wanted to do in the message, so I, but in Ephesians chapter 2, 4, 5, and 8, is very beautiful scripture. But God, rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, in Christ, he, we, he quickened us in Christ together. By grace are you saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. How many are grateful for that gift of salvation? God's grace speaks to the core message. I said God's grace speaks to the core message of life. Why are we here? Where are we headed? And does anyone really care? Those three things God's grace speaks to. Why are we here? Where are we headed? Does anyone actually really care? Jesus was human like us. He experienced sadness. He experienced a certain amount of frustrations and longings as we do today. Who was and is the authentic Jesus of the scriptures as depicted in the Bible? Fully God and fully man. That's hard for us to wrap our minds around that Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man all at the same time. It's hard to comprehend that. Hard to understand. We call that the incarnation of John chapter 1. The real Jesus of radical forgiveness, radical compassion, love, and Openness to people that other people would have excluded. Aren't you glad he included us and did not exclude us? He included us. Ultimately, we need to know Jesus' teachings. But even more so, I think it's very important not only to know what he taught, but to know how he lived and how he managed life here on earth as a human being like us. How did he manage and how did he deal with the things that he had to deal with? The Bible says he was tempted in all points as we are tempted. In other words, he experienced everything that we experience. He was 100% human. Same frustrations, sadness, I think at my sister's graveside, I always bring this out many times when I'm doing a graveside, that it's amazing that the creator of the universe, the God that put all these planets and stars in space, is the same God that at the friend, graveside of his friend, the Bible says Jesus wept. And what's fascinating about that, that God would actually cry over his friend that passed, that he loved dearly. And he knew, he knew that in a matter of minutes that he was going to bring him back to life. He knew that. But yet he still cried 
at the graveside of his friend Lazarus. Jesus cried over his friend. That tells us something very important about God. And I think that the only explanation that I've been able to satisfy my own curiosity about that, I do believe that Jesus looked down through the corridors of history and he knew how difficult it was going to be to lay our loved ones and lay them to be put back into the ground from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I think he saw that. He knew that how hard that would be for us to sit there in those chairs under that tent in the graveside. He saw what we would have to experience. And we most of us have always been there with someone that we loved. We need to know how Jesus lived on earth. How he experienced those challenging situations as we do today. Let's talk about the real Jesus and stress. Man, how many has ever heard the phrase, too blessed to be stressed? Well, we are blessed, but I'm afraid every now and then we're stressed too, even though we're very much blessed. I mean, we would like to think that we're so blessed that we'll never be stressed. But I'm afraid it sounds good on a, looking on the back of someone's bumper sticker, but it may not work out quite as easy in life. We are stressed, and our world is stressed. Jesus gets that. Come on. He faced the issues we face, and some of them far more severe than we will ever face. Jesus said his soul was grieved to the point of death. Yes, Jesus, the Son of God, God himself said he was stressed to the point of death, grieved and stressed, according to Mark's Gospel. But in Luke, we have a, a doctor's opinion. Yeah, the doctor gives his understanding of what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. He suffered a rare condition caused by an acute emotional stress whereby sweat glands ruptured, causing them to excrete blood. This was Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground, Luke 22, 44. And I had Joan put this in the notes. It's interesting. Luke, the doctor, would be the one who would mention this rare medical condition. Jesus' full humanity is on full display in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus taught us by example how to deal with the challenges of life, how much God really cares for us. Dealing with the anxieties and stress coming from those daily challenges we face, we must come to, to some understanding, to some degree, Maybe not fully, but to some degree, we have to come to a place of understanding the sovereignty of God, at least to some degree, and what it means to submit our lives to the sovereignty of God. Not easy. Easy said, not easily done. Dealing with anxiety and stress, we must come to that understanding of the sovereignty of God and our willingness, if I say willingness, to submit to Him. That will give us the courage. That will give us what we need to pray the same prayer that Jesus prayed. Your will, not mine. 
four words are the hardest prayers to pray. I've looked through the whole 66 books of the Bible. I did a sermon. What is the hardest prayer ever prayed in the Bible? And I went through all the books of the Bible, through all the characters of the Bible, and the different prayers that all these people prayed. But to pray this prayer, your will, not mine, is the hardest prayer that we will ever pray. Very difficult prayer to pray. For some of us, it's all about control. Man, do we want control? How many of you have ever met a control freak? Well, <laughs> don't be pointing fingers now, Joanne. I mean, somebody did. I saw somebody do it. I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, we have this thing about we want to be in control. Yes. In control. It's, uh, I tell the example sometimes. Uh, I wish Terry was here with her, with her bike. You know, she's a biker. And uh, you see this guy going down the road on his bike. Well, Stephen's a biker too. And he, he's, his hair's blowing in the wind, especially in the, in the state where they don't have to wear helmets. And he thinks he's in control going down the road. But one little pebble in the road can tell you who's really in control. It's, it's an illusion. It's an illusion about control. The truth is we can't take control because it's not for us to take. If only we could. It, but it's just an illusion. I mean control. Well, maybe and maybe not. Things can change real quick on that. But we need to be able to pray the prayer. The life of Jesus teaches us a better idea. Rather than seeking control, how about relinquish it? How about resigning as the boss of the universe? It'll free you up. It'll make you feel so much better if you're no longer the manager of the universe anymore. The boss running everything. I had a lady come to see me and she was struggling with all kinds of things we're talking about. And she came three times for the same thing. And she was a real nice lady. I said, honey, today we're going to record this. I'm going to do you a favor and we're going to record the same thing I told you the other time, but we're going to record it this time so I can save your gas. You won't have to come back for the same thing. She lived pretty far away from the church. So I thought, I'm doing this to save your gas because I know you don't have a lot of money for gas. So we're going to record it this time so at home you can play it back. You won't have to spend your gas on it. Listen, rather than seeking control about our lives, it's time to relinquish it. Jesus prayed, your will, not mine. Go ahead and resign as the boss. If you struggle with running your world like you would like, try entrusting it to God. And everybody said, Amen. and a few people said, oh me. And a few people said, Amen. Boy, we struggle trying to run our world the way we want it to be run. And like I said, by and large, it's just an illusion. We're not much in control of much of anything. We think we are, maybe we want to be. But the, the best thing you can do is give it to God and trust it to Him. The apostles, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord's sovereignty, in essence, is what he said. And you find new freedom in God. Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. How many would rather rejoice than be stressed out over life? Wouldn't it be a whole lot better to learn to rejoice in the Lord instead of being so stressed out about so many things? And I, I think that the Philippians passage is interesting because it says it over and over again. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And then again, in case you didn't get it those other two times, rejoice in the Lord. Always. So much better than trying to run everything. 
I appreciate Tammy was seeking a, or they were seeking her for the possibility of a position in the company she's with. And, and I, I really appreciate her saying this. Well, Dad, I prayed about it. If God wants me to have it, He only knows whether I need it or not. This, this position that was a pretty high position that she would go to. And she said, Dad, I'll just pray the Lord every day. God, if you, I'll give my best. I'll put my best foot forward. I'll interview. She had three or four interviews. I'll put my best foot forward. But only God knows whether I need this position or not. And I'm leaving it to Him. If you don't want me to have it, I don't want it. That's a safe way to go. Damn, it was good, huh? But she wound up getting it. Now she may be saying, Lord, help me. Leroy, give Leroy the ball. When Leroy get the ball, he don't know what to do with it sometimes. But anyway, if you struggle running your own world, the best thing to do is just entrust it to God. Take a deep breath and relax. Really and truly, let God, let Him drive. I had a lady in my church who had a tag on the front of her car and said, God is my pilot. But she also had a dent big enough for a telephone pole to be in the front of her car. I said, you better let God start driving. You got a tag that says, God is my co-pilot. You need to make him your pilot. It looked like she hit a telephone pole and the whole telephone pole would go in the front of her grill. Man. She needed God to be her pilot, not her co-pilot. Let's talk about the real Jesus and loneliness. Man, what a subject. Was Jesus ever lonely? Have you ever wondered whether Jesus experienced such loneliness? So many of his father, followers in the land of his birth would so many people around him all the time. We watch the chosen, I think, Pretty soon after we finish Romans, we're going to do the children all the way through up to what, where they finish now and where they're at. And we'll, we'll, on Wednesday night, we're, we're going to go through that maybe two at a time. I think we're planning on that possibility. So we'll be finished with Romans pretty soon. We're going to, in the summertime, we're going to see the chosen. What a great, great thing. But Jesus had so many followers, but he experienced loneliness. He knew what it felt like to be surrounded by a loving company like us, but he also knew what it was like at a moment's notice to lose people that followed him, that loved him. Just at a moment's notice. And one time he said something very stark, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no part of me. And the Bible gives the tag to that and many followed him no more. When he gave that truth, many followed him no more. During his lifetime, Jesus watched many of his followers walk away. When he was prosecuted unjustly, his closest friends abandoned him out of fear. You ever had a friend to abandon you? You ever had a friend to betray you? Jesus did. Max Locato describes it this way. The most gut-wrenching cry of loneliness in history didn't come from a widow. It didn't come from a patient. It came from a hill, from a cross, from the Messiah, my God, my God, Jesus screamed, why have you abandoned me? Come on. Come on. You think you're the only one who's ever felt lonely? No. No. The back of your page. I think of all the people who have looked towards heaven and cried out that one little three-letter word, why? 
Oh God, why? Why? With no easy answers sometimes. But Master Cato goes on and said, I imagine him listening as that person cries out, why? And I picture the Lord's eyes misting and a nail-pierced hand brushing away the tears. At that time, he may not offer any answers, but he who once was alone understands exactly what I feel. Would you let that just think about that for a little bit? I picture his eyes misting and his nail-pierced hand brushing away the tears. And he may not offer any quick, or quick answers to why, but he who once was alone understands exactly how I feel. The real Jesus in loneliness? Yes. Yes. Now for our last portion. The real Jesus in politics. Oh wow. This is interesting. Was Jesus ever fed up with politics? <clears throat> Has anybody here ever gotten fed up with politics? I explained to my son-in-law, because he was in politics for quite a few years, worked in the state capitol in Madison, Wisconsin, one of the most magnificent capitals in the United States other than Washington, D.C. I explained to him where the word politics comes from. Poly, from the Latin, means many, and ticks means bloodsuckers. I don't know if he appreciated that too much, but he got the message, he got the idea a little bit. I'm just breaking down the word for you. Did Jesus become fed up with politics? Man, well, we'll find out. In Jesus' time, in Jesus' time, communities were deeply divided by differences in religious belief. Political positions and all kinds were deeply divided and bitter differences in religious beliefs. Political positions, income inequality, legal status, ethnic differences. Sound familiar? <clears throat> Jesus lived in the middle of a culture war too. Come on, Jesus lived in the middle of a culture war just like we do today. Everybody say, okay. And though the political systems were different, but not that different, there was still greed, there was still corruption, hypocrisy, and oppression as we see today. Not much has really changed. Come on. Come on. Jesus was born at the height of the Roman Empire's power. They had conquered the most the known world, and including Israel, it was conquered, along with Israel. And of course, there were taxes to pay. How many ever heard the thing, there are two sure things? Death and taxes. We know that very well. Look at this in your notes. There was per person tax, there was road taxes, there were business taxes, if that wasn't enough, there were religious taxes charged by the priest. Pardon. Amazing. In Israel, political and religious factions were one and the same. Back then it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Today, we have conservatives and liberals, left and right. The Pharisees, by, on the other hand, were the most religiously conservative leaders of the religious order. 
They had the most influence among the common working poor who were in the majority. They believed that a king would come one day and conquer Rome and free the nation of Israel. They would also add extra rules and requirements designed to force the working poor into a form of subjugation. Well, we know about that, don't we? Now, the, 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 the other group was the Sadducees. And as you've heard about them, they're sad because you see why well, they're sad. They're called the Sadducees. They were wealthy aristocrats who had vested financial interest in Roman rule. They were in charge of the temple and didn't believe in any kind of savior king that was coming to change things. They made themselves wealthy. It sounds very familiar. They made themselves wealthy. Is anybody else amazed how people go into politics, and especially the higher echelon of, of they go in there and they're only worth three or four, two or three hundred thousand dollars in worth. Aren't you glad we don't have any better collecting at the door for you to get in to come to church? We don't even pass the plate around. We let you just come and put it in. It's crazy uh, what they did here. And then there were the Samaritans. Often oppressed, they were marginalized because of their racial, ethnic identities. The common farmer, fisherman, and craftsman's family lived through a highly volatile political period overbearing religious leaders who despised and oppressed them, wealthy elites who ripped them off. And then there were outbreaks between the people and the oppressive army. So where was Jesus in all of this? Wow. i got to wipe my eyes for a minute. So where was Jesus in all of this? Man, you know, Jesus had the power. He could just point his finger, just whip his hand, and wipe it all out. The answer, right? You wish he'd done that, right? Just wipe his hand and just get rid of those bad people. What did Jesus do? Where was he in all of this? Did he align himself with the religious elites? with the wealthy and the powerful, or did he start an uprising to overthrow them? The answer is none of the above. He knew what was going on. But Jesus went from town to town offering hope, new life, and a different way to live, and thereby he changed the world. Instead of pursuing power, instead of pursuing money, instead of pursuing religious authority, he shared a loving, sacrificially generous way of living. Each of these political groups saw him as a threat, and they sought to kill him, and they did. Yet in spite of their efforts to take him out, he still changed the world. I said he still changed the world. Jesus' movement was so impactful. Listen to this now. Jesus' movement was so impactful because he didn't allow the culture war politics to deter or distract him from his mission and purpose. He stayed on message. He didn't let it deter him or distract him. He stayed on message. We should take notice of that. Listen, we see the culture war. We want to fight in the culture war and the darkness around us. This past week, I got enraged. I was ready to stand up and fight somebody. The L.A. Dodgers had a time to have a show where they had the Catholic nuns dressed and Catholic nuns in, in dress, in drag. And the, the, whole, the whole thing that was played out in Los Angeles was anti-Christ program. And they made fun of the things of the cross. They had a cross there and made light and sacrilege of the cross. This took place in our country. What a, the target didn't, 
didn't learn any lesson from the men going in the bathroom 12, 14 years ago. Now they've got satanic children's clothes. They have transgender stuff right there where everybody, the kids come in to see it. I mean, you see this culture war. It's unbelievable. And we want to get up and we want to fight. We want to curse the darkness. We make the most righteous vote we can. We vote the best policies we can. And we'll do a boycott. And I don't know if it helps much, but it makes us feel better. But here's the truth of the matter is, we've got a still message. Somehow, we're so vexed in our spirit. We witness what's going on in our culture daily. We want to fight the culture war in the darkness. But we must not lose sight of the gospel message of the church. It is, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that will ultimately change the hearts and minds of our culture and our world. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You can fight Target, and you can fight all this, and you can boycott there, but it's the cross of Jesus Christ that will change the world. Amen. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grace goes where no government can. I said grace goes where no government can. Listen, grace gets to the bottom of this thing we call life. The gospel of grace is the message of the church and it's the Christian's hope. I said it's the Christian's hope. Jesus didn't try to curse the dark. He cursed the darkness, but he didn't try to deal with all the politics that was around the culture war that was around. He knew what was going on. He, he did claim the temple out. There were some times where he, he did some things, but by and large, he went town to town. When we were in Israel, we talked about how far these people had to walk, Jesus and the disciples, how they had to walk hundreds of miles to go from town to town and proclaim the gospel. Now think about it, 2,000 plus years later, there are people gathered all over the world doing what we're doing this morning, all because Jesus changed the world. And his sh short three years of ministry, just three years, he ministered, but yet he changed. Jesus was in a culture war too. But the thing that changed people, it was the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ. And it's what will change today. Listen, these, these companies don't learn. Target didn't learn from the last time they lost millions. And Heiser Bush, maybe they, they lost billions too. But maybe they'll learn, maybe they won't. Who knows? We boycott this and we boycott that. And our pastor in, in Raleigh went on television two weeks ago. Our church there runs three or four thousand, the assembly church across the assembly. And he, he was bold. He, he owned public television. He said, I will never, I will never shop at Target ever again in my entire life for what they've done. Maybe it helps, makes us feel better. But ultimately, the only thing that's going to make a difference is the grace and cross of Jesus Christ, ultimately. And that's what Jesus did in his world. And that's what we may need to think about for our world. As Joe comes up, I need you more than yesterday. Um, I want to give you something to put on your refrigerator. Uh, it's a collaboration of Joe, Barb, and myself putting it together this morning, because I wanted to, Tanya, could you help us with that, buddy? I want you to, I want to give you something, keep in mind, I want to give you something, little small words here, that have caused more people to go to missions than maybe anything they've ever read, and so this one, uh, Jim Elliott, Jim Elliott and his wife and his missionary team were in the Amazon and they went to a tribe of the Aka Indians who were very primitive. All the missionary husbands were killed by the Aka Indians. The wives were spared. They came back home to bury their husbands. They went back to that tribe 
and won them all to Christ. The same men who killed her husbands. And she wrote a book called The Gates of Splendor. And this is the saying that Jim Elliot lived by. And this is his saying. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That one saying of Jim Elliot has caused more people to become missionaries around the world. And it's been years ago when this happened in the Amazon. Many years ago. I was a young man then. And it affected me as well. And the, I want you to put this on. I made sure you put it on your refrigerator. And this other saying by Tim Keller. Tim Keller was a great pastor and a great writer and author. And he passed away a week and a half ago. And I wanted to honor him this morning. And I want to give you this saying that he wrote. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. Yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared to hope. You gotta look at that. You gotta look at that on your refrigerator this week. Look at it and receive what you need to receive from that. Let's stand together. Come on.
families have so many people they minister to. They're waiting on you, Pastor David and Becky. They're waiting on you. They wait on us to join them. God is so good. He's just not the God of the universe is way up there, but he's the God that cries. He's the God that knows what I feel and what I'm challenged by. He knows it all. He knows every bit of it. Thank you, Lord. Pastor David, would you close our time together? Let me get you like a Has your heart felt the thrill to the call of a master? Have you answered, I will? For the conflict of the ages, told by prophets and by sages, is upon us in its fury, is upon us today. Lord, as we see these things unfolding before our very eyes, may our hearts catch the thrill that you are coming soon. You will put away all sin and evil. Help us to be faithful to you, step by step, as pressure grows, as we are pushed aside as fundamental Christians. May we stand strong. May we have a spiritual backbone, Lord God. Help us, help us to be determined that we are going through as the songwriter said, I'm going through Jesus. I'll pay the price, whatever others do. I'll take my place with the Lord's anointed few. I'm going through Jesus. I'm going through. Help us all in this building today to determine in our hearts that we're going through no matter what happens. Amen. Let's do I have decided. I have decided. I follow Jesus. How many have made that decision?